Side Hustle Show 205, from a million dollar bankruptcy to 20 grand in monthly recurring revenue. This is a productized service case study. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. What's up, what's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where it's all about ideas, action, and results. All three are in full effect today with my friend Gabe Arnold. He's the founder and chief pencil sharpener at copywritertoday.net, a subscription-based article writing service. In this episode, you'll hear how he came up with the idea, how he landed his first clients, and how he scaled the business to where it is today with a team of 50 remote writers and $20,000 in monthly recurring revenue. He says, creating a subscription model business has turned out to be one of the best things I've ever invested my time in. It's led me to grow from barely being able to provide for my family for the first time in my life, reaching a six-figure income and the flexibility to truly work when I want to. You can find all the notes, links, and a free PDF highlight reel with all of Gabe's top tips for building a recurring revenue service business at sidehustlenation.com slash Gabe. Before we dive in, let me take a moment to thank today's sponsor, FreshBooks.com. The all-new FreshBooks is transforming how freelancers, side hustlers, and small business owners like you deal with their day-to-day paperwork and accounting. The award-winning invoicing and bookkeeping software has been redesigned from the ground up and custom-built to save you time, money, and headache. Visit FreshBooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30-day free trial today. I'll be back to tell you a little bit more about FreshBooks, plus my top takeaways from this chat with Gabe after the interview. Now, this story starts in a pretty low place. Gabe lost his construction and remodeling business during the real estate crash and ended up declaring bankruptcy. He turned to freelancing to support his family. It was absolutely the worst time of my life because I got divorced. My grandfather passed away. My best friend died. It was like the worst 90 days of my life. I'm sorry to hear that. (laughs) Yeah, it was a little, little rough, but I learned a ton out of it. You know, I learned what a lot of money looks like and how to manage it incorrectly. And now I know how to manage it a little bit better. And then, you know, kind of walking away from it, I was like, you know, I'm going to stick with the tech stuff because I like that. I started building websites and mobile apps and doing like tech help and stuff like that. It's actually what led me to the the copywriter today idea, because what I found is I've kind of kept kind of rough track of all the websites I built through that 10 year period or so. Um, And we, I built over a thousand websites for people and, I kept hitting this wall of, I would come up with this great design and put in filler text for the homepage or the about us page or, you know, services page. And then I'd go back if I was building them for you and I'd be like, Hey Nick, do you have any about us page copy or are you ready to fill this in so we can launch the site? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'll get that to you. And then I would never hear back on it. (laughs) Okay. Dude, a thousand sites. (laughs) Something like that. I have a running (laughs) log. But I kept hitting this problem and I'm like, so, so what I realized is like, the content on the websites was a huge issue. And the real issue behind getting it from the client was either they didn't have time, they had no problem writing or talking about themselves or creating their blog post or whatever it would be, but they just didn't have the time to do it. Or they hated writing. And they're just like, I don't like to write. I don't know how to write. You know, I hated writing in school or whatever their reasoning were. And so to get like three lines out of them was, was very, very difficult. So I would have the project up on the demo server and be like, hey, do you like it? And will you approve it? And then they'd be like, yeah, it looks great. You know, the only thing we need to do is get the copy written. And I'm like, all right, great. Like, when do you think that'll be? And they'll be like, oh, you know, next week. Or they make up some deadline. And I have these projects sitting 100% done on my side, but without content. And then I'm held up for 30% of the money or whatever the payment deal was on the project. Yeah, whatever the final installment is. Right. It's like, as I'm like, that's like my profit on the project. And so I'm sitting here and I'm like, this is horrible. Not only for me, because I wanted to get paid and finish the project, but also for them, because they've invested a bunch of time and money. And then this project just completely stalls out. We started at that point getting into writing for clients a little bit, not in the format that Copyright Today is now, but that's when I started to do some writing. Okay. Like, look, look I, we've, we've discovered this is kind of a, a pain point for people. Tell you what, let us take care of that for you. <laughs> exactly. And then I like, I'm like, what do people charge for this? You know, I go through that process and I just started adding like a fee into a project. So maybe a $1,500 simple, really simple website. I added a thousand bucks on it for writing or whatever it was. Like, so I was just trying to figure that out. And that was, that definitely solved part of the problem. So like, I at least had taken a step in the right direction in in solving the issue. But 
then when we had solved that part, it was like, okay, great. At least I'm getting paid and finished and we're launching these sites. When I would go back and look at a site like three months later or six months later, and everybody wants a blog, everybody wants to like, oh yeah, we're going to put updates on our site all the time and we're going to be super active. Yeah. <laughs> and then the reality <laughs> is I go back and it's like a ghost town. They, like it still has the, we'll be posting something. Like we would put a little basic post up, like we'll have updates coming soon. We just lost our site. You know, I could go back three months, six months, a year later. And it was the same post and nothing had happened. Yeah, it's got like the default WordPress, <laughs> hello world or something. Exactly. Basically that sitting there. So I was like, okay, so this part isn't working. What if somebody just paid me like a small monthly amount, something that's like pretty painless so that they could have constant new content going out on their specific niche or industry. And then they could use it on their blog. They could use it for email marketing. If they need the landing pages, if they need a press release, it's like written content is written content. Like it doesn't really matter in a sense where you put it. If you have you know, new good information going out, that's kind of where I came up with the idea. I remember it was like early in the year 2014. And one of the things that I've tried to do for the last few years with, with some, you know, some overall success, I think, is everybody does New Year's resolutions, all these different things they're going to do. I always just tell myself, I'm going to do one thing this year. If I can do one thing this year, then it'll be a massive success. <laughs> so I don't get overwhelmed or split up between different things. Okay. And I remember... My one thing that year was like, you know what, I'm sick of just doing projects like we would be up and we would sell huge projects in the web and like 10, 15, even like we sold an $80,000 development project the year before that. Wow. And then like typical service people, like we all do this. It happens at every entrepreneur that I know, like we'd get completely immersed in the project and forget about marketing and sales and like, cause we're totally buried in a huge project. And then we come out of that project and we have this huge dry spell of, we have no money. Like what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I was so frustrated and sick of that feeling that the first of 2014, I was like, you know what, this year I'm going to create a product because if I can create a product, then it'll sell in my sleep and I won't have to worry about it and I can have reoccurring revenue. And so with that one thing goal for the year, and then continuing to kind of like kick around or push this idea of creating content for people. I'm like, what if somebody just paid me a low monthly fee and took care of all their content? And that's kind of where the idea came to mind. Okay. Did you originally pitch that to those web development clients that you were working with? Or tell me about your first customers for the service offering. It was a combination of existing customers and brand new people. By kind of dumb luck, I did a couple things right on that front, which, which was good. And I'd always heard, and I kind of always knew, you can always make the most money off your existing customers. You can always sell more product to existing customers way faster than going to find brand new customers. So I split it up between existing customers. I had like a couple small website pr projects um, where we were just doing some maintenance or small stuff. And I went to those folks and I said, like, here's this idea for 79 bucks a month. You can get as many articles as you want. There's a turnaround time for them, but you know, we'll write whatever you want. Lisa Malice, she's a time management consultant. And she was one of one of my clients. And she's like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. That's awesome. And so she jumped on and then... For 79 bucks a month? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, for unlimited writing. <laughs> right. So, so that was the first idea. Okay, I have a, I have a feeling the pricing discussion is coming next. <laughs> yeah. And there's a reason why I did that. And, and then I've learned a ton, which which we can definitely like get into what you should do on the pricing front. <laughs> Okay. Everybody's like, of course, like, I think that's less than a meal out most places. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so she's like, yeah, no problem. I'll try it. And there was one other existing client. I can't remember who it was. And then the other thing I did, which ended up being massively successful, and I've actually kind of adapted this process, which I can get into too, like on the marketing side, is I went to my LinkedIn network. And I, I think I probably had a thousand connections on LinkedIn, maybe 1500, not none at all, but not a yeah. huge, huge following or something. And I just went through and started private messaging people with really no discrimination of like what industry they were in or what, no segmentation or no, no thought process to it, except for I would just start messaging the people from like A to Z through my list. And like I said, I would send them like, Hey Ryan, I've got this brand new service that I'm working on. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to take like 10 minutes and give me your feedback on it. I have this new idea. It's like, it's a bait idea. Can, would you be willing to give me some feedback on it? Okay. Okay. Pretty much the message. And then I got a really high response to that. I would say I got like a 30% reply rate to that of interest. There's a couple of reasons why I think the response rate was so high. One, I truly believe like if you reach out with just 
a sincere, honest kind of short note to somebody, I think they can feel your, your attitude or your tone, or like they can feel who you are through your writing. Yeah. And then the other reason to be fair and honest is that LinkedIn messaging was a lot different three years ago than it is today. However, the same approach still does work. I just think that it would be more realistic to think if you do it right, maybe get a 10 to 15% response rate at this point. Okay. Because it normally will ping your real inbox. Like it'll ping your email. Yeah. Like, hey, so-and-so sent you a message on LinkedIn. I've got this new project I'm working on. Do you have 10 minutes to give me some feedback on it? Yeah. That's like, it. if you're a connection of mine, if, you're, if you have some pre-existing relationship, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely if you have a pre-existing relationship. But these were people I'd never talked to before. They were just straight connections. Okay. I'm a super... Are you a, are you a lion? I am a lion. <laughs> A lion is a LinkedIn open networker, basically someone who's open to connecting with with anyone on LinkedIn, whether they know them or not. And sometimes you'll see people put lion in their profile summary or their description on LinkedIn. And I first learned the term uh, a few episodes ago in episode 190 with Rachel Peterson, who used kind of a similar method to Gabe to land her first clients for her social media management business. I'll connect with anybody. <laughs> okay. I'm of the opinion that this connection could be value. I could help you with something someday, or you may want to help me with something. So I'm like, sure. I want more friends the merrier for me. Okay. <laughs> so I reached out with that. And so a couple things happened. One, Ryan came back, like was, he was one of the first ones and he's been on ever since. And I think Ryan introduced me to you, but I don't remember. Yeah. That's how we first discovered the service. So Ryan was in one of the original Side Hustle Nation, Inner Circle, Mastermind Groups. He's on, I think, episode 34 of the podcast talking about his SEO side hustle service and basically was like just singing the praises like, oh my gosh, I found this unlimited writing service. It's awesome. I'm setting up like multiple accounts for my clients and he convinced like half of our group to join and <laughs> he really endorsed it. So that was just like a gold mine. So that was, that was huge because I get to meet you and so many other clients and he was just thrilled and like, Ryan, his site is WP Amplify. I mean, you couldn't find a nicer, more honest, like trustworthy, just guy that you want to do business with. Yeah. He's just become a great friend. And so that was just like really fortunate. There's nothing I did to deserve that or no strategy behind like finding somebody. You just happened to be like connected to him on LinkedIn. He was one of the people that responded to your message. Yeah. So he's just like, he's like, yeah, I'll check it out. So like, I think I had like a 15 minute conversation, Max on the phone. Here's how it works. I'm like, this is brand new. If this looks like a great fit for you, that's awesome. You can join the beta. And here's the other thing. I'm like, I know this is brand new. I said, if you're not happy for any reason, you're one of the early folks that's going to be getting in. There's a hundred percent money back guarantee. Okay. If you get into this a month and you're you're like, this is the worst idea you've ever had, Gabe, <laughs> then you ask for money back. I'll just give you the money back. Cause I'm like, I don't ever want anybody to walk away feeling like I wasn't fair with them. Yeah. Okay. So you're getting a couple of people like, yeah, I'll give this a shot. And they're expecting unlimited articles. What does that look like on the fulfillment side? Like, are you <laughs> the one like pounding these out or do you have another writer behind the scenes? How's that look? Yeah. So that was the really interesting part because I was the only writer at that point. <laughs> okay. So it was like Ryan. And then I ended up, he brought me in my first four or five customers and then a few other people came on. And so that was the part. So I think I had like, if I look back at the numbers from that month, I think I made like six hundred dollars or something <laughs> pretty small but all thanks to kind of just the using some outreach process well that's pretty good and i want to bring up something so you see i look i got 1500 connections on linkedin that's probably well above the average and so some people might be saying hey look, i don't have that many connections but like you do have people in your network a friend of ours just started a kickstarter campaign didn't have any social media presence in fact you know it was like man i really should have paid more attention to the social media stuff but like just went through his gmail contacts he like had 10 years worth of gmail history and found thousands of different people that he'd emailed over the years and just sent them messages one by one kind of filtering a little bit to be like okay this is somebody right. who's, you know, is this relevant at all but <laughs> yeah you probably have a bigger network than you give yourself credit for yeah i would agree with that i think everybody does and that's why i think it's good to stay in touch and it's good to you know do what you can to just be connected with folks because it pays off in the long run if you've been around and not burned all your bridges and i the only reason i mention that is because for me like losing the company and going bankrupt for a million dollars that happened because I got stuck for a bunch of money myself. And then that snowballed into just a bunch of bad stuff. But I hurt a lot of people and made a lot of people really, really angry. So I basically rebuilt my social network over five or six or seven years, I guess, kind of thinking about it to get to that point of like having people not hate me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good thing. Okay, geez. I mean, I just kind of mentioned that because if you're an entrepreneur doing this on the side or 
even if you're getting to that stage where you're kind of going after doing it full time, you are going to make mistakes. And unfortunately, bad things do happen. But if you just stick with it and stick to the right things, then you can really build a network, no matter how large or small, that can really be somewhere where you're contributing value and that you can get value out of too. Okay. So you're signing up a couple original clients. You're delivering all the work yourself. What's going through your head at that point? Is this going to be a viable thing or is this not worth it? Yeah. (laughs) This is how I try to implement ideas. I try to implement them as absolutely as quickly as I can to see if they're of any value. So I had thrown up a WordPress site. I probably had like two or three hours in. I'd been a longtime customer of Wufu, which you can even use free forms, but they're like a couple bucks a month. So like my cost at that point was probably 30 bucks a month max. Customers would go to a password protected WordPress page, which is like the simplest you can do. They would log in. They would have to put their name in the form. And then they would say, this is what I want written about. I would get the email and it it just went to an orders email address. Then I would write the order and give it back to them. I mean, I remember some nights I would be finish all my other work and then work on this. Some nights I'd be like writing for like three or four hours just to get all the orders back to people. Okay. Was there a specific WordPress plugin you're using to do the password protection? No, it was literally just on any WordPress page or post on the side where it says visibility. There's something where you can change it to password protected. Oh, okay. And I told people like, this is a private password. Don't tell anybody what it is. Because <laughs> oh, okay. if they would have given out, anybody could have come in and order. So it was like... Oh, it was one global... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But no, this, this is actually really good to hear. Don't put the cart before the horse and, and all this stuff before you need to. I know a lot of your listeners and a lot of us kind of digital entrepreneurs were in the digital space. But what I see the equivalent of happening is if, if you think back a few years before our big digital age, people would be like, I'm starting a business, I'm running an office, I'm putting up a sign, I'm getting business cards and doing all this stuff. And they had no idea if the business idea was any good. And so they're doing all this busy work. Unfortunately, I see people in the digital age, and even with the brick and mortar businesses today, they start worrying about like, do I have the best login software, the best membership area? They start doing all this busy work that has nothing to do with proofing out the business model. Yeah, I've always tried to like hack it together in the best way that I can just to see if people like the idea. And then I go back and improve it, rebuild it, you know, do whatever I need to do to make it really like as smooth as it should be. Right. So what came next? You got the rudimentary site up, you're pounding out articles at night. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What are you charging at that point? What's the price point? So for like the first 90 days, I was under a hundred bucks. I was like at that 79. Okay. Which was kind of like mimicking what WP Curve was at, right? Yeah, exactly. To back up a little bit before I actually kicked it off, I'm like, I'm going to build this product and I don't have a physical product to ship. I'm not really a developer. I'm kind of techie, but I'm not to the end where I can write a piece of software that's going to solve people's problems. So I'm like, wow, this is awesome. WP Curve productized service. And I'm like, I'm good at service. I've done service my entire life in, in different areas. So I'm like, well, they're doing 79 bucks a month and people are paying that. Why not just give it a try? And I figured like worst case, I could do some extra writing. And at that point of kind of where things were at, I, I was thrilled that I made an extra six or 700 bucks a month, whatever it was. Yeah, absolutely. It was a huge lift. And for people starting too, it's like, I always try to remind them like that first customer that pays you 35 bucks a month or whatever it is, that's gold. Don't worry about getting to the million dollar mark at that moment in your life. Just be like, man, I'm solving a problem. People are willing to part with their money for it. So I'm on to something. So the early pricing that first 90 days was under a hundred bucks, but Ryan was telling everybody about it. I was getting more responses from my LinkedIn kind of outreach process and sharing it with more customers. And people like, this is the greatest idea ever. And they were signing up. So I was like, this isn't going to scale. Because <laughs> like, it takes me however long it takes to write each article type. I would time, we basically at that point, I think we only had 400 word articles, 800 word articles and 1500 word articles. And that was the only three things that we offered as far as like content type. Yeah. Well, what we should do for the sake of comparison, I've had guests on the show, freelance writers, and my minimum is like $250 per article. And you're promising to do a dozen articles for $79 a month. Right. So yeah. So the premise was, I said, basically you can get unlimited content, but there's a turnaround time for each order type. 400 word articles take two business days, 800 word articles take longer, like so on and so forth. Okay. So that was your way of like kind of throttling that. Okay. Yeah. Because otherwise somebody comes in and like places a hundred orders. It's like, well, I can't do a hundred in two days. No. Yeah, we'll do, we'll get to them, but like we can only do one at a time. So the, my theory was it would be like a queue where they stacked up in there. And so that throttled it. But I'm like, if you need more, you can just get another account. I'm like, it's no big deal. You just have to buy another account. Okay. Okay. So that way it really is unlimited. And 
that was one thing that was a good choice in the beginning, kind of as like our branding, because people were like, what? Unlimited content? And they would look into it and they would engage with us. It was a really good early kind of tagline because it got people's attention. And so what I did early on is I timed myself on how long it took to research and write an article. I wrote about time management. I wrote about for some STEM education school. I wrote about health and fitness. Like I wrote about all these different topics and I would time myself and see how long it would take me to write them. And then as we got busier, I realized two things. One, I kind of have a habit in my entrepreneurial career of coming into the marketplace with like just rock bottom cutthroat pricing because it's one customer acquisition technique that I've been able to use well. So I go in and I use it here. I'm like, we'll write for 79 bucks. And everybody's like, we'll do that. I had immediate traction. And then once I kind of figured out the rest of the business model, I raised prices on all the new people. And I didn't, in this case, have to raise prices on the old people because the new customers carried the deficiency on the existing customer. Okay. So like you guys are gonna you guys are gonna be grandfathered in, but for new people, it's gonna be a higher rate. Yeah. So at that point it went up to ninety seven and then I think it went up to 150. And then at this point, our front page pricing is two ninety seven. And we've actually raised prices every early on we raised prices every six months and now we we evaluate prices once a year at this point. Okay. So ticking up on the price, you're calculating your, your kind of like hourly rate. And yeah. Okay, this doesn't make sense at this rate. So we got to raise this. And then the word is kind of spreading to new clients. What else were you doing on the marketing front to get the word out and kind of grow this thing beyond just yourself? So I was really fortunate to have six months or a year before I started this idea connected with one of the founders of OpenTable on LinkedIn. I sent him the same message, but about a, another idea that turned out to be just the dumbest idea I've ever come up with. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he was fine. He's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, I'll take a look at it with you. He's like, I'm always into like startups and stuff like that. And his name is Glenn and he's very successful, very wealthy, like really great with startups. He took two or three hours and kind of laid out for me how to build a SaaS model business, like the pricing that you need and usage in SaaS. The assumption is four people sign up and one person uses it in software as a service business models. And then during that process, I told him my position, I'm like, I'm trying to move away from this project income because honestly, I'm not making good money at it. The cash flow is up and down so bad that I'm struggling. And I said, so I, it's not like I can come up with an idea and then put $5,000 a month into Facebook ads every month for it or anything like that. I'm like, I have no marketing money. <laughs> so he's like, well, that's no big deal. I rarely spend that kind of money until year two or three or whatever it is. He said, all you need to do is just go out and get affiliate partners. And so he walked me through setting up a basic affiliate partner program, even without software in a sense, just even using like coupon codes. And then he talked to me about how to like go out and prospect for other JV partners or affiliate partners. I started kind of understanding how that worked before I even started this idea. But then when this idea came up, I was like, okay, here's how I can scale this without having a huge marketing budget because I don't have that yet. You know, it's so early on. Yeah. So you kind of paying on performance and even no software needed like honor system right no referral code <laughs> tracking like hey you know somebody use your code but it's expensive on the back end because it's eating into your margin yes so early on we were paying 50 percent of the first month to the uh, affiliate partner as long as the customer like renewed to the second month but then over time i realized we hadn't really nailed down retention as, as well as we wanted to and we had these other factors so sometimes we would do all this work and i looked at it i mean like five bucks because <laughs> um, as we grew obviously we brought in more writers and the team had been growing and so it was great because everybody's making money except for me <laughs> um, okay but after kind of figuring that out i started kind of adjusting the percentages we were paying and then we ultimately moved to where we just decided hey we're going to pay a monthly percentage for every month that the customer's on, because then my affiliate partners benefit from reoccurring revenue and I don't lay out a bunch of money and the client cancels middle of second month and I made no money in the whole process. So that was kind of how, like you mentioned, like the pay for performance kind of affiliate marketing model is really successful as long as you are taking a good look at your numbers and your profit too. So obviously that's the whole point of creating something new. <laughs> Anything specific you did to go after affiliates or try and recruit people to do the marketing for you? I always tell people LinkedIn is a gold mine because what I did is there's a huge affiliate marketing group in LinkedIn. I joined the group and I just started connecting with and messaging people in the group and saying like, Hey, I've got this product. We're looking for affiliates. We pay X dollars right now. My best affiliates are making this much money. Would you be interested in talking about this? 
and affiliate marketers get approached with offers all the time. So you're selling to them. Obviously you, you got to go through it, but out of that, I got some good responses and ended up connecting with more affiliates. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That approach has been really, really successful as far as just direct outreach. I've done all the sales for the product until very recently, the, just the last few months, we're finally at the stage where I've got a tight enough process and the budget to where we're starting to bring in a couple sales folks to do a little bit of sales on it, you know, outside of me. Now, is it a product where people like want to get on the phone with you before they sign up or do they just say, at this price point, we'll give it a shot? When an affiliate makes a referral, we rarely talk to the customer before they sign up. When I'm doing direct outreach, then I end up doing some more personal phone call or, or thing like that. So. Okay. So the affiliate channel is one channel. The direct outreach is another channel. Describe what that looks like. The direct outreach approach is like, I get into LinkedIn and find somebody that's in the digital marketing agency, connect with them, reach out and say, hey, we have over 50 writers on our team and they're all US-based and we can write about any type of content and just kind of like start the conversation and just say, is this something that would be of value to you via messaging them through LinkedIn and usually some follow-up calls as well. Sorry, say that again. It was a group owner on LinkedIn? Oh, no, I'm sorry. The direct outreach stuff, I would just search for people that were owners at a digital marketing agency or owners at an SEO company or somewhere where I know they need, that they need content written. Okay, okay. And then I would connect with them and find their contact information and just start start to reach out to them. Okay, this is an interesting angle. So not not necessarily targeting the end user, but targeting somebody who deals with lots of end users, the agencies. Yep, exactly. So that was very successful. I've always just try to look and say, okay, who has the greatest need for this and who's probably struggling to fill that need? An end user is not as valuable as a prospect to go after comparatively just because they may only need three or four blog posts a month or they may not really see the heightened value. Whereas a digital marketer or SEO company, they know they need original great content to do their job. Right. So it, it's like air that they need to survive. So I would go direct to people with those type of titles in LinkedIn we still do that. That's very effective. You know, I had somebody respond back earlier to and they're like, I need 200 articles a month. I'm like, all right, awesome. We can do that for you. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Whereas before, if it was just you, you'd be like, um, okay. I'll do it. <laughs> I got to sharpen my pencil. When that stuff comes in like that, even early on, I, I'm always like, all right, great. We'll do it. And then I go figure out, we'll how, figure out how to get it done. <laughs> and then the other thing that I've done real successfully is Google and industry. So like top SEO firms and then find their contact information, reach out to them and do that. So between LinkedIn and between just like looking at top lists in an industry, that's been real successful. The kind of variation that I've started to do a lot more of it, it's a lot more effective because you get straight to the people that need your help the most is joining a Facebook or LinkedIn group. This kind of works in, in both places as well. That's targeted around that I know has people that would need my services. So like I'm in one called the secret team. I think you may be in there. I don't know. It's a pretty big group. This is uh, Chris Brogan's group. Yeah, exactly. And so then I go in and I just, in the group, you can just search for help and I'll go through and look through all the help requests. Like somebody will say like, Hey, I need help with my blog or I need help with, you know, some sales copywriting. And then I just come and say, Hey, I'd be glad to help you with this private message me and we can go from there. And what I do is there's kind of like two parts to my thought process and why this is very successful. One, I truly believe like if we take time to give and serve and help other people and just put value out there, then that's an important thing to do. And it comes back to you over and over. You know, the law of reciprocity is just huge. So you're just literally going to like a little search box in the corner of these Facebook groups and searching for the word help. Yep. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it is like, I just shared this with my private mastermind group before the call because I'm like, I never shared this with anybody, so I'm going to share it with them and I'm going to share it with everybody inside us because it's the coolest, easiest thing to do and it, it costs you zero dollars. I love it. <laughs> so I would help in there and it, it's great to find like real estate has groups, writers have groups, entrepreneurs have groups, marketers, like sales and marketing groups. Between LinkedIn and Facebook, you can find thousands of people in your niche and then you just put help in. And then if I saw you in there tonight, Nick posted, man, I really need help with like some ideas for my blog post or I really need help with this sales page, I would just say, Hey, like private message me, I'll give you a hand. And what I do is I'll spend 20, 30 minutes helping them do it completely for free and be like, Hey, if you ever need anything else, just let me know. And that's it. There's no sales pitch whatsoever. And then what happens to 10, 20, 30% of those people is they're like, that was awesome. Thanks so much. Can I pay you? And then I'm like, no, it's okay. If you ever need my services, let me know. And we can talk about it. 
what I found happens more and more, like if I were to do that, it helped like 10 or 15 people in a day. I don't have exact numbers on this, but this is kind of like my gut on it. And what I've done, then like two or three of them will come back again the next day or later that week or be like, hey, you know, I need a hand on something else. And I'll be like, great, you know what? This kind of falls into where I'd want to put you in, into our product or service because we can help you the best that way. And then those people convert really well. I mean, you get a conversion of 50 or 60 or maybe 80% even because they're like, this person knows what they're talking about. They were willing to help me for free. You have all this goodwill. And so they're more than willing to try an engagement with you. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of like the evolved LinkedIn or Facebook outreach process that we're doing a lot more of now and that some of the folks on my sales team are doing. And really all it requires is you being willing to just help and serve and care for somebody else out there, like you know, you that needs help, and then having some expertise in the area because you can't offer to help somebody if you don't actually know how to do it. That just will just blow up in your face, obviously. <laughs> right, right, right. Tell me about bringing on writers to fulfill this work as the client base has expanded in maintaining the quality. That part is probably the best part of this project, you know, this product and of this learning process for me, because it helped me learn something incredibly valuable that I apply across the board now in everything I do. So I have this kind of theory that there's two customers in every business, and that's your customer that you sold the product to. And then it's your team who needs the work. And as long as you're effectively selling to both groups, then you're going to be fine. There's all these writers forums, like jobs, like everybody's always looking for writing work. And what I started to see is, like you said, some people will charge $250 to do a writing project or $100 or it's $50 for a teeny little article. And my belief about that was that people had to charge a lot of money for a project because they didn't know when their next project was going to be. Yeah. So if they could land a project this week or two or three, then it was great, but they didn't know if they were going to have a project next week. And so that's kind of like the freelancer approach, which is nothing wrong with that. But that's kind of what I identified in that audience that I needed to attract. So I was like, well, what if I can go to a writer and say like, hey, if your quality is good and you can follow our procedure and process, then you can make two to three to five to thousand dollars a week with us. And would that be attractive to them? To clarify, that was 200 to 500 dollars a week with the top writers maybe earning up to a thousand dollars a week. And everybody I approached about it, they were like, yeah, like if I could have consistent work, then then it's great. And you... I have the ability to do that because you have clients signed up on consistent monthly recurring billing. Exactly. So like, I know my guess was early on. I'm like, I think I can keep people on an average of three months and I was able to achieve that. And now we're like crossing the six month retention mark. And our goal for that's next great. year is to be like nine plus months. Cause that's, yeah. that's kind of a big, big step there for us. But so I could go to writer and say like, I know you'll have work every single week. All you have to do is turn it in within the time limits and you know, on time. And everybody's, I should clarify, like everybody's working from home, right? Like I don't imagine you have in Cleveland <laughs> some call center office where everybody's like typing away. No, we're a hundred percent remote team. So okay. we have, we have absolutely no overhead and everybody, are, they're all freelance contractors because it's technically set up, right? They can work whenever they want, however they want, as long as they do their work. So everybody works from home. Basic requirements is like, you have to have a computer and a good internet connection. That's pretty much it. <laughs> like there's no, there's nothing crazy. We do have degreed trained editors and journalists and stuff on our team now for some specific hire and packages and things like that. But we don't require somebody to already have that writing degree or anything like that. Did you put the people through like a trial process? Like how do you judge if somebody is a good enough or fast enough writer? Yeah. One of the greatest assets that I've been able to create on this company that I replicate into other things that I do now is there's a completely automated onboarding process. If you hit our, do you love to write page where you submit your resume and application the next step takes you to a how-to video to how to finish your application. And we ask for two sample writings and they have to read our writer guide on this is how we do our work. These are our quality standards. This is what the pay is. This is the expectation of how fast things are going to be turned around. And we build everything we have as a flat rate pay scale. If you are a writer who's really good and really fast, you make really good money. They make effectively, like I've talked to some of my best writers, they make effectively anywhere from 25 to $35 an hour. Flat rate, you mean like per article, we're going to pay you X dollars? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So some people it's not a fit for, and that's completely fine. But before they even get to the part where they have to submit two sample pieces for us to finish that step two of the application, they read through our manual. It's completely explained. They know what it's going to be like to work with us and like expectation of if you do well, here's your opportunity. 
Or if this isn't a good fit, you would go through the training and be like, I can't write that fast. And so I'll probably make $3 an hour or whatever it would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be. I imagine you have more supply of writers than you have demand for writing. So somebody goes through this automated onboarding process. What happens? I imagine you could have your back end kind of flooded with writers. Yeah, early on, it was a little bit harder to recruit writers. And like I would go out to Craigslist and I would go out to writing job boards and like I had to look because I didn't know where they're at. Now we get like a couple applications a day. And after they submit the samples, one of my managers will look at the content, make sure they followed everything and just follow the process correctly and their writing is good. And then if they're selected to come on board, they actually go through another three hour training about everything in depth. Cause we say, okay, we do want to hire you and need to go through the rest of this process to get there. Okay. Okay. So it's not just, everyone just can't sign up. Like there is some sort of human manual review there. Yeah. So they're all, they're all manually reviewed. And then after they go through all that successfully, that's about maybe five or 10% of the people choose to, or have the ability to, to get all the way to the end there and and do it successfully. So that filters out all the people that aren't a fit or aren't good writers or whatever it is. And then when they get all the way through their training, then they are actually given a couple internal assignments usually. And then we monitor what comes back and we're just doing our final check to make sure that it's still a great fit and that they're going to be a good fit for the team. We got it dialed in now. And how many on your team now? It ranges. We're up and down, but we've got over 50 writers all the time in it. And then we have a couple designers and developers for some other kind of things that are going on, but it's pretty good sized. So. Wow. Super cool. What's next on this? Just kind of continuing to grow the subscriber base? Yeah. So we continue to do the same kind of process of outreach that we do directly. We're focused more on growing our affiliate base. At least 50% of the business is from affiliates. So we're continuing to grow that. And then we're finally at the at the stage now where probably, you know, in first quarter, we'll start to do some paid advertising for the service. Okay. And yeah, I think you kind of have a few years of history, you know, kind of like what your retention rate is going to be, you kind of know your lifetime value, you can start playing around with some paid ads. Yep, exactly. Well, very cool. I should use this opportunity to mention that I am a former Copywriter Today customer. That was a cool service. Ryan you know, turned me on to it like he did with everybody in the uh, Mastermind group. And I am also an affiliate of theirs. So Gabe, I understand you have a special offer for Side Hustle listeners. Yeah. So I'm just super excited to be on with you today. And I, and I love the community here at Side Hustle. And so we are offering a half off price. If you go to copywritertoday.net slash side hustle, then you will be able to just see what we have there for you. And then we're going to be adding a couple of bonuses in there that we don't normally give away either. So you want to check those out. We will appreciate you putting that together for us. Thank you for that. Copywritertoday.net slash side hustle. And Gabe, let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. I think my number one tip is when you're getting started with any idea like this, what you want to do is as quickly as possible, get to doing the work of selling the idea and validating it with real dollars. And so that's the number one thing I tell people to do is mock up a one page sheet of paper that says what you're going to do. Go out and tell people, hey, would you be willing to pay me for this? Great. If you are, it has 100% money back guarantee because I want to make it successful. And if it's not, I want our relationship to continue to be a good one. So I'll give you your money back. Well, very, very cool. Gabe, thank you so much for sharing some of these marketing hacks. And I'm excited to see where this thing has gone, you know, from zero to pretty significant business now helping you know, 50 people earn income on the side and helping probably hundreds of customers get content for their site. I mean, helping lots of businesses on both sides. So very exciting stuff. We'll catch up with you soon. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is sponsored by FreshBooks. I've been telling you about their innovative cloud accounting service for a while, which, by the way, started as a side hustle. The software was built specifically for freelancers, side hustlers, and entrepreneurs like us, and was just redesigned from the ground up to make it even easier to use. So let's talk about invoicing for a minute, because everybody needs a way to get paid, and this was the feature that first drew me to FreshBooks. Number one, it takes as little as 30 seconds to create an invoice. No formatting, no formulas, just simple, clean, professional-looking invoices. You can add your logo and color scheme so that your invoice reflects your brand. Second, there's even an option to set up recurring invoicing and billing, so uh, if you want to sell a subscription service like Gabe, you're all set. Next, if you're working on a big project, you can ask for a deposit up front so you're not left holding the bag for the full amount uh, and having a client that wants to stiff you at the end. 
So here's the deal. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial for Side Hustle Show listeners. To claim it, just go to freshbooks.com slash side hustle or enter the Side Hustle Show in the How Did You Hear About Us section. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle for your free 30-day trial. All right, my top takeaways from this chat with Gabe. Lots of takeaways, hard to narrow down to just three, but here goes. Number one, tap your network. I know this is a really common theme, but I thought it was interesting to hear how Gabe turned to LinkedIn and to Facebook to find his first clients. And a 30% response rate might seem high, but when you're in the trenches and getting seven out of 10 people ignoring you, I can tell you there was some perseverance there to, to get through that. Takeaway number two, practice just in time business. That means not building out the perfect infrastructure before you have any customers. He, you just heard him say, Hey, look, here's my one page explanation of what I'm going to do. Will you pay me for this? The perfect infrastructure is one that lets you get paid. Takeaway number three, what's your one thing this year? Gabe said his singular focus for 2014 was to build a product, build something for recurring revenue to stop the feast or famine freelance cycle he was having in his uh, website building business. And he made that happen by hustling his face off to validate this idea and deliver the work. Remember, he said for two months, he was the only writer on staff. Now, with 2017 right around the corner, got me thinking, you know, what's my one thing for next year? What's my singular goal? And more importantly, what's yours? What are you going to get done no matter what? Notes, links, and a free PDF highlight reel with Gabe's top tips from this episode are at sidehustlenation.com slash Gabe. And if you have the need for constant new content and want to give Copywriter Today a shot, be sure to take advantage of Gabe's half-off deal for Side Hustle Show listeners at copywritertoday.net slash Side Hustle. Now, at that price, don't expect Pulitzer Prize winning journalism or like truly epic pieces, I'm afraid. You're probably going to have to write those yourself. But for, for a, a steady stream of native English written uh, articles pretty tough to beat. If you do sign up, just send me a note, let me know, and I'll send over 365 blog post ideas to get your creative juices flowing and to make sure you have plenty of of title prompts uh, to send over to those guys. So thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen, and I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to The Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 